This is truly all of my clan, my five beautiful children, and three beautiful, lovely daughter in laws, and my four, drum roll please, grandkids. <laughs> If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Doretha Bell. I am married to Jim Bell over there, 34 years as of yesterday. And, uh, <laughs> yes. And this is the fruit of the 34 years. <laughs> now, my kids, it's actually a true story. They made that for me last Mother's Day, and uh, it's a fun story. You know, when they're little and you're giving them all the rules and the do's and the don'ts. And we just built this new section, brand new carpet and of our house. And, you know, we'd gone over the rules of that area of the house specifically. And that really happened. And Christopher, my youngest, really did come tell mom. And um, so, and you, as a mom, you lay out all this now just go through it. And I did, I explained like we, it's a new room, it's a new carpet, da, 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 you know, and so you come back to make sure that they've heard you. So, okay, now what did we learn today? You know, and he really did say, don't tell mom. So, <laughs> so that's a fun story in our family. And um, just wanted to share it with you just uh, as introduction on Mother's Day. So welcome to Mother's Day. John asked me a actually probably a couple months ago to, to speak this morning. I don't normally do that. I'm usually next door in the kids area most of the, the time. If you think Jim's a single dad, he's not. He really is married. And um, we just don't get set together in church very much. But um, he asked me and I said, let me pray about that because I don't really speak in, in to big people that much. And so... Um, I never got back with him. He never got back with me. And he said, you are on the schedule, right, in a couple of weeks. I said, yeah, I am. <laughs> so, so, no, I, I did pray about it. And I did feel like it was something that I was supposed to say yes to. Sometimes you say yes to things even when they're uncomfortable. And so I felt like this is one of those things amongst many things. But this was one of those. And then also it dawned on me. I was thinking, what? You know, you begin to think about what to speak about on Mother's Day and almost bucked it said no i'm not going to speak a mother's day message i'm just you know that's just too traditional that's just what you do but the holy spirit wouldn't allow me not to he really did put a message in my heart for you today for mother's day so it is a mother's day message but i did begin you know in that you think back to some scriptures and things i came across titus 2 and i thought wait a minute that's why john asked me because titus 2 says let the older women teach the younger women. So I have arrived. I am that aged woman now. So <laughs> giving you a hard time, John. So, you know, it just happens. You wake up one morning and you've been married 34 years. <laughs> aged. Uh, it just happens. And it's a good, good season. But Mother's Day. Wow. 86% of Americans celebrate this holiday. It's a big one. And I even did some fun looking up on statistics, and it says that we in America will spend about $25 billion on this holiday. And just cards alone, they say we'll spend $2.5 billion cards. So that's why it's called a Hallmark holiday. <laughs> it is a Hallmark holiday, and it is one that we embrace. And I also realize that on this Hallmark holiday, you know, there's... We come from it from all different kinds of ways. There's some of that fully embrace it, and it's just, you know, the holiday for you that is um, enjoyable and easy and, and just wanting to be sensitive to what it means to so many because mothers have lost and are experiencing loss. You know, some are still waiting, knowing that God has in their plans and future that motherhood, and there's just... And there's different kinds of mothers. Those we have adopt, those of you who have adopted, those of you who have spiritually adopted, we have all coming from different perspectives this morning. And you know, I almost let that weigh on me. And I said, no, Holy Spirit, you put this message in my heart. I can trust you to speak what you want to speak to the ladies, the fathers, the single adults, Everybody who hears this, I can trust you. 
that you will allow them to hear and receive what they need. And so I release that to you this morning. So it is a Mother's Day message. And I did not really know what to title it, and I even hesitated putting it on the outline because it seems so, I don't know, but instructions for mothers, you know. (laughs) But that's what I kind of titled it because as first-time moms, do you remember that if you have been a first-time mom, you, you and your spouse look at each other and you think, this didn't come with an instruction book. What do we do? You know, and that really as Christian's parents, it does come with an instruction book. And we have all the answers that we need. And it's the Word of God. And so I am pulling from the Word of God, but I also want to pull from what God has placed in my heart. When I would speak to different ones about, when I mentioned I was speaking, they just said, well, just speak from your heart. And I said, well, that's really what I want to do. I don't want to speak at you. I just want to speak from my heart. And I do have a little bit of experience I haven't probably experienced all or everything. None of us have the same story. But I want to speak from my heart this morning and to just ask the Holy Spirit to deposit into your heart what he wants. So I began to prepare, and I said, Father, what is it that I have walked through, that I have learned, that I have, that you have put in my heart that I would want to unpackage this morning? And the very first thing that I felt like the Holy Spirit wanted me to start with is we must, as moms, as parents, as dads, as dads, don't check out on me this morning. You with me? (laughs) This is for you too. Daughters and sons, don't check out on me. This is for you too. He said, what do you want me to deliver? And he says, and I really feel like we must understand, recognize it's God's grace. It's God's grace. He has called you. He has anointed you to be mom. Last on the, on the, what's that we use in staff? Dovetail or echo or whatever, (laughs) from what John said last week. He was talking about Ephesians 2.10, that God has chosen you long ago for his plans and purposes. Put that in the context of motherhood. Motherhood, it's, it's his plans and purposes, how he's fulfilled his plans and purposes on the earth. You are part of that. And we were talking through that and walking through that last week. And so here it is on Mother's Day. He has called us. He has chosen us. He has graced you. He has anointed you and he has called you to be the mom that he has appointed you to be. And he's made everything available to us everything that we need to be that mother that he has called us to be, and that's called grace. It's not called perfection. He didn't call you to be perfect. He didn't call you to raise perfect kids, and that somehow creeps into us easily, that there's some kind of perfection that we are to attain to, and it's not about that. It's about God's grace and recognizing his grace You may may be a parent striving for perfection if you feel the need to get it right. First time parents, we can relate. I remember my first child, and I remember my mother leaving after that first week, and I was down in Lawton, Oklahoma, and she was up here in Tulsa, and that was a long ways away. And she was driving out of the neighborhood. And I'm going, I have this baby. What do I do? I remember the, the seed. No, no, not CDs. Tapes. Amy, Glenn and Amy. If, Glenn is my brother. I don't know if, if you know that, Glenn and Amy. Amy's my sister-in-law. She had given me this awesome thing of tapes. And it was a good curriculum, and I listened to that, and I wanted to apply that, and I had Brian on a schedule, which schedule's good. (laughs) I had Brian on a schedule, and I was doing everything by the book. Of course, by the fifth time, fifth one, I had five children, by the time the fifth one came around, wasn't quite so diligent, and they all survived. But wanting to get it right is what I'm saying. The perfection, there's something that is in us that think that it's in us to make it perfect. 
You may be striving to be a perfect parent if you want to control the outcome of everything. Let that one sink in. You may be striving to be a perfect parent if strong feelings of being overwhelmed and inadequate or prevalent. Now, I'm not saying that moms, we're not overwhelmed. Hey, we are overwhelmed. And that is one of the words that we use a lot. And it's, I know what they're doing in there right now. If you heard them screaming, we do that every Sunday morning. And that's where I'm usually at. <laughs> we use overwhelmed a lot. The sleepless nights get us overwhelmed. The restricted schedules get us overwhelmed. And able to keep the house picked up for eight minutes keeps us overwhelmed. The late night homework meltdowns for mom and child, we get overwhelmed. Walking through the senior year of high school <laughs> is overwhelming. <laughs> Adulthood leading, guiding their transition, they're praying over them, seeking God's face for them. Whatever season it's in, when we're doing it within our own strength and within what we think we have to muster up in our own power, it gets overwhelming. But there's a verse, that 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and you not, might not have ever read it in the context of a mother or a parenthood. But my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. It's his power that is made perfect in weakness. It's submitting those weaknesses to him, allowing him to make his power strong. When you mess up, you allow his power to be manifest in you. You know, parents, you get really good as you listen to the Holy Spirit. If you listen to the Holy Spirit, of repenting yourself. My responses many times were not right. Actually, they were reactions and not responses. <laughs> were not right. And I had to go back. Hey, will you forgive me? And they will remember that. Another video a couple of years ago that my kids made for me was one out of just heartfelt gratitude. And it was so special to me. But one of my sons says, Mom, I remember how you were easy to ask us to forgive you. Wow, this was coming from a 21-year-old at the time. And I'm not patting myself on the back. It's God's grace. And I'm sure I didn't do it many times when I should have done it. But it's okay to just acknowledge and say, I messed up. Will you forgive me? And you know when that is. Are you saying every time you got onto them, you, you, no, I'm not saying that. You know. The Holy Spirit speaks to your heart. You know when those responses have been wrong. You know when you reacted in wrong. You know. You know, and so allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart, and you allow His grace to flood over you and to make His power strong in your weaknesses, and they will remember that. They will remember you allowing God's grace to walk you in this parent journey. And also, there's another verse, Psalms 127, in one of the translation, if God's grace doesn't help the builders, I'm thinking this was the, the Passion Translation, if God's grace doesn't help the builders, they will labor in vain to build it. Wow. Who wants to build anything in vain? <laughs> no. We want what we build to last. We want it to be strong. And that brings me into my next point. Walk in obedience. Now, I know we've heard this over and over and over again, but I want to talk about it in the context of Mother's Day, the parents, and also in the context, if you're not a father or mother this morning, context of your house of walking in obedience. 
The scripture I want to refer to as I introduce this is Luke 6, 46 through 49, and I'll read it off the screen. Why do you call me Lord? Now, this is Jesus speaking. He just got through speaking a powerful sermon, sermon the Beatitudes, Sermon on the Mounts. He just got through telling and giving some really good guidelines of how to live. I mean, this was from Jesus himself. And then at the end of that sermon, he says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. Now, let me put this in the context of you and me as parents. We have guidelines. We have rules. We have these parameters. Why? To protect our children, to guard them. They don't know that. At an early age, at the earliest, sometimes really early, their will, their sinful nature rises up, and there's this battle against you trying to show them the way, direct them the way, teaching them what the word know, and their self-will just coming against that. And they, you're doing it because you love them. You're doing it because you're trying to protect them. You're doing it because you want them not to experience the destruction. Jesus was saying the same thing. He said, here's what's going to happen. Your house will be full of life. And it will stand if you obey my words and keep them and obey them. If you're like a person who hears the words and does not keep them, then your house will fall and it will be great. Does that sound like a parent? telling you, if you do this, this will happen. If you do this, this will happen. And I want you to be safe. And that's God's heart towards us. And he said, when the storms come. He didn't say if. He says, when they come. We're not promised a life without storms. When they come, what's going to happen? We've sang songs. We've had scriptures about the rock today. It's a theme about building on the rock. It's a theme about he is our foundation. And all goes back to the word of God and walking in obedience. That's the digging down deep part. It says dig deep. What does the digging deep look like? It looks like... The word and obeying the word, studying the word, applying the word, memorizing the word. We had a guest a month ago who challenged us to memorize scripture. I took that on. I keep saying it to my family. He said, you want to hear my memory verses today? (laughs) I'm up to... 28 verses. <laughs> yeah, pat me on the back, because that's a big thing. <laughs> I, anyway, I didn't say that first service, a side note. But he imparted something to us that night, and he imparted it to me. I don't, wanna, I don't want to believe the lie, and I told the kids back there, like, you know, you get to a certain age, and you just check out and say, well, I can't do that because of my brain, you know, you know, a, I can't do that. We expect the little ones to do that, but I can't do that. And I said, that has to be a lie. I'm not going to receive that. And so I have to work at it. And I did what he said. I listened to it, and I repeated it. So anyway, side note, that wasn't in my notes, but it was imparted to me. And so I can impart that to you. But that's digging deep. That's doing the hard stuff. And 
exactly what Jesus said. He says, the result of the wise men's response is a strong house that withstands the storms of life. The result of a foolish man's response is a house that falls with great fall. Response of entering the broad gate and walking the wide and concludes in destruction. I borrowed um, a quote from 201 a couple of weeks ago when I taught in there, and it says, your life, and I put in quotes, your house, point to your house, your house will be settled and strengthened in proportion to your willingness to hear and practice God's word. And I have a quote for you. Here's another one. Seldom does anyone wander into obedience. I'm going to say that again. Seldom does anyone wander into obedience. We must take time to digest the word and choose to obey what we have read and purpose to obey it. That's the straight and narrow. That's the straight gate. That's the narrow path. It's hard. It's digging deep. It's applying disciplines. It's not easy. It's not easy. But the results, just like it's not easy for our kids. Don't do that. <laughs> God's saying, it's not easy, but look what the reward is. When the storms come and the waves come, your house will stand. You will not be the, like the foolish when the winds and the storms came because it had no foundation, no word. It was swept away and there was a great fall. God has the best for us because we're his children and he preserves, wants to preserve us and keep us from the destruction. First one that we talked about. What was my first point? Yes. And the second point is walk in obedience. You have notes in front of you. And the third one I want to bring up is stay faithful. Remain faithful. I want to look at 2 Timothy 1.5. And this was Paul, and he was talking to Timothy. He said, Timothy, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. I want to talk about this verse for a minute personally. God has given Jim and I an opportunity here this past year to share our testimony of a Christian heritage. We got to go to Mongolia and share it with first generational Christians, and we get to do it some here in 301. And, and the more we do it, the more I just meditate on it, and the more I just, you know, just thankful. And um, so as I'm preparing this message and I come to this, this verse, once again, I am so blessed to be a Timothy. Matter of fact, my mom was going to call me Timothy until she found out I was a boy. And a matter of fact, I want to introduce my parents to you right now. They're in this congregation. Mom and dad, would you stand up? I honor them. I wanted to say something earlier, but I wanted to get to this point, so I wanted to wait. <laughs> Thank you for being here. He still preaches every Sunday morning at 85 years old. What a heritage. And as I was preparing this message on Friday, I was standing in my office, and Glenn has, you know, has, has admonished us to practice your message and to, to preach it. And, the, and I turned around and I looked, and there was a picture on my office shelf. And this is my dad's dad, and this is my mom's dad. 
I'm a Timothy. Rich heritage. And these were preachers. <laughs> these were preachers. I show you that to encourage you, and not for you to say, well, Dreetha, that's not me. Look at you. No. I want you to see that you were chosen, and you might be the first generation, and you might be that grandpa up there. And your Timothy or your Doretha might be up here one of these days. So don't say, I don't have that. You say, I do have that. Where are you at in the generational line? I don't know. I just happen to be where I'm at. And I get to taste the fruit of it. And I'm thankful for the heritage that's gone before me so I can walk in fruit. Stay faithful. What if they would have given up? What if my parents would have given up? What if I would have given up? That's the second verse I want us to look at in Timothy. Timothy 3, 14 and 15. But as for you, <laughs> talking to me, talking to Timothy's, talking to you, Continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from when you, whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. I have a choice. Will I continue? We all have a choice to continue. Now as parents, I want to tell you it's worth it to continue to keep planting those seeds. Keep planting those seeds. It's not glamorous. It's not easy. Keep planting those seeds. In Galatians 6, 9, it says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. We can't afford it. Eternity is in our hands. It was in God's hands, but we cannot give up. Be faithful to plant those seeds in proper time and due season. You will taste the fruit. Now, as I said, we've been married 34 years. We have five kids ranging from 19 to 29, four grandkids. We're getting in a season of life where we're getting to taste some fruit. We're getting to taste it, and it's sweet. What do you mean, Dreetha? Just like the scripture says, the kids are rising up in blessing. The kids are rising up and making a choice to continue. And you're saying, well, my kids haven't done that. It's not in your timeline. Continue to sow the seeds. Whatever level, wherever they're at in their chronological, chronological age, it's going to be a different. You just keep praying. Don't give up. Don't grow weary in planting those seeds of prayer. Don't grow weary in planting those scripture verses. And I mentioned Bible Blast this morning because I'm a, a, a big cheerleader of Bible Blast. Bible Blast is a tool in our hands here at DLC. Is it the answer to everything? No, it's just a tool. Every fall to spring, we have a program for kids in elementary age. Jim and I led it for 10 years. We have some graduates sitting in the room, and they will tell you the Hudson's uh, children, especially specifically uh, Joseph, every time he sees me, he says, Mrs. Bell. Of course, it's you guys because you did it at home with them. We just led it here on Wednesday nights. But he thanks me. He says, that's how I've known the word because of that tool. It's being faithful for James and Ruby to say, get in there and study, or let's get our memory verses. The Coleman kids, they memorized the whole book of Ephesians when they were in elementary. And that's not in my notes either. I kind of got off on Bible Blast. What I'm saying is, it's planting the seeds. It's doing the hard stuff. It's saying the, 
the memory verses at the railroad track crossing because you have a few to- few moments to with and stand and you know do nothing and so you go over your memory verses. It's sitting at soccer practice while kids are out there playing and you have the four babies inside and you're going over questions while you're nursing one and everything else. <laughs> Been there, done that. <laughs> But I'm getting to taste the fruit, and the fruit is sweet. Don't grow weary. Thank you, Mom and Dad, for not growing weary. So let's go back over before we get to the last one. The first one is... Recognize it's all God's grace. It's not you. It's God's grace. Number two, walk in obedience. Number three, and number four. I left this one to last. I don't know if there's really any order of importance, but this is my sustaining strength. And once again, I think it's because an impartation my mom my dad embrace welcome the presence of God we can do nothing without the presence of God there's nothing more sustaining than his presence and Mary chose to do just that one day in Luke 10, 38, 42, just think about this picture. I do this in kids' church. So let's just think about what this looks like, you know? And here is Jesus and his disciples. They were on their way. And he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She was hospitable. She welcomed Jesus. I can see her now. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Now, this could be a whole nother sermon, which I won't go there, but you women, we can understand what's going on here. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that, I'm reading off the screen. Uh, that's, no, all the, oh yeah, here we go. Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. (laughs) Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one, actually. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Mary chose the presence of God. Now, women, I know we can put ourselves into Martha's shoes very easy. Just think, Jesus is coming to your house. Of course you have to have everything dusted. Of course you have to have the laundry put away. Of course. I mean, that just seems like, right, Ruby? (laughs) That's just what has to be done. Those are legitimate reasons. Like, company's coming. I mean... I can't say that much bad about her. You know, it's like you want things to be good and perfect. But here Jesus was. That stuff doesn't matter. Just sit at my feet. You know, moms, we can justify dads. We can justify young adults, daughters and sons. We can justify distractions And some of those are legitimate. I told a story in first service that years ago, I was walking through a season of just really wanting to commit some Bible time to God. And this is before phones and Facebook even. And I said, every morning I'm going to get up and I'm not going to do anything, but just go straight to my devotions. And the very next day I got up, I walked past my dryer Uh, Oh, my goodness. I remembered I left clothes in the washing machine. They need to get in the dryer, like, right now so they don't mildew and get stinky. And, and, you know, that's a legitimate distraction. (laughs) But 
But the Holy Spirit kind of spoke to me in that example. He said, are you really going to not get distracted? And so I heard the Holy Spirit, and I walked past the dryer, and I didn't do it. But I've never forgotten that. I'm not saying I have obeyed like that every time either. But it was a voice that I heard that even legitimate distractions are distractions. It's embracing his presence and sitting at his feet. I really believe that distractions are the biggest thief in our lives. Living in 2019, I believe it really is the biggest distraction. I mean, distraction really is the biggest thief in our life because there's so many distractions that I don't think any of our generations before have ever come against. I mean, there's always been distractions. I mean, laundry can be distractions, but I'm talking about so many, so many distractions. And I'm convicted every day of what will I allow to distract me from the presence of God. I want to be like Mary. I want to choose to sit at Jesus' feet and just quiet. Do I trust God that he will take care of all those other things? And even the scripture says, don't worry about tomorrow. I'll take care of it. Just come sit at my feet. That's where you're going to receive strength, young people. That's where you're going to receive everything that you need. It's in his presence. I remember as a little girl. And I tell the kids back there all the time, when Mrs. Bell starts crying like this, doesn't mean she's sad. I said, that's the presence of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes your emotions just get like this. And, and I'm really easy to cry. And I'm not sad. And I explain to them because they might not know or have seen that or experienced that. And I said, I said, you really can feel the presence of God. You really can. And sometimes your emotions just don't know how to handle it. And so you cry. It doesn't mean if you're not crying, you're not experiencing the presence of God. It's just the way I'm made. Probably something I hear from my dad because he cries at the drop of a head. <laughs> but it's the presence of God. And I remember as a young girl, experiencing those times. And that's what I want for your kids back there. And that's what I want you to want for your kids in your house. I want you to want the presence of God. Invite them into the presence of God. Let them see it. Let them feel it. Let them hear it. So, Dorith, I don't know what that looks like. It might just be setting down to do your own personal devotions and them hanging all over you. They might not even have a clue in their understanding. But their spirit understands. We say around here there's no junior Holy Spirit. Do we really believe that? I question that all the time, and I'm not getting on to you or me. I'm questioning myself. Do I really believe what we say? Do I really believe there's no junior Holy Spirit? I, I want to say I do. I really believe I do, but I want my actions. I want my motives. I want everything that I do to say that I believe it. I want you to stand with me this morning. You might be here today. You might not have ever accepted Jesus as your Savior, your Lord, to walk in the grace that we've been talking about. And that's the very first thing as a house. It's the very first thing. And I want to welcome you to do that today. You can be so bold to come up here. We'll pray with you. You can be so bold 
to come to any one of us leaders and we'll pray with you. Do you want your house to be on sand or built on a rock? None of us ever build planning to fail. We never build a structure thinking, oh, this is going to fall next week. That would be foolish. (laughs) We don't want to be foolish. We want to build on solid, solid rock, the foundation. It's going to stand when the storms come because they're coming. They're coming. So that's the first thing. If you have received Jesus and you are a believer in him, we're going to challenge our prayer time today as we sing the song that we sang here at the end while I go in his presence. And they begin to sing that. I thought, that's it. It's in his presence. The four things we've talked about today. Where do you need to set that reset button? Is the reset in understanding and just walking in his grace and say, yeah, it's your grace, God, I'm walking. Is the reset Okay, God, I'm I'm going to read your word. I'm going to obey your word. I'm going to go to 401, get deep into the doctrine of your word. The reset might be making a commitment to faithfulness. I'm going to remain faithful. So my Timothy, one of these days, can be declaring the word of God. And it might not be in my lifetime, but uh, my prayers, my seeds of prayers, I'm sowing today. I may not ever see it. You may not ever see it. My grandpas aren't seeing me today here physically. And I have no idea what they can see or not see in the heavens. But I know they know. You may be re- hitting that reset button No. I'm going to put away distractions. Distractions. Oh, Holy Spirit, help us to call distractions what they are. And not just to justify, but call them what they are. Am I a Martha taking care of things? Or am I a Mary sitting at Jesus' feet in His presence? Let's cry out for His presence this morning. and Listen to the Holy Spirit. What does He want you to hit that reset button?